morning, everyone. Uh, so we're going to be continuing our study into momentum, uh, looking mainly at our collisions. Remember, the physics up to this point has been fairly simple. It's just been momentum in, all the momentum before, whether it's a collision or whether it's something that's breaking apart or joining together, the momentum in has to be conserved uh, with the momentum that's out. So I just want to draw you a quick picture here. I want you to imagine that my entire universe fits inside the circle. Obviously not to scale here. <clears throat> When we have that law of conservation momentum, when we're saying P in is equal to P out, definitely for this one here to be conserved, for these ones here to be equal, that applies to our whole universe. So sort of whatever number the total momentum is inside my universe, that number can't change. As you know, the universe is a very huge place, so I can't study all the universe at once. So usually what we do is we're usually localized into what's referred to as a system. Again, not to scale because that system would still be huge there. But in this case here, the system could be my collision. It could be my rocket ship that's dropping off the boosters and whatnot, okay? This is what we're specifically looking at. We're not caring about the surroundings. We're not caring about the environment around us. So this one here will be called surroundings. The nice thing about the law of conservation momentum here is this momentum is conserved, conserved for both the system, just the system itself, if you just look at a collision, we're going to practice a problem in just a second here, but the system is actually conserved, the before the crash and after the crash, the PN is equal to PO, as well as being true for the entire universe, for both system, and you can say surroundings, or you can even swap that here with just the universe. So this one here is actually fairly restrictive, whether it be uh, the whole universe all at once, or whether it's just a collision that we're caring about, uh, the momentum has to be conserved. Turns out when we look at energy conservation, again, we're going to do a, another chapter on uh, energy uh, as the next part, but uh, for energy conservation here, we similarly have E in is equal to E out. All the energy that we have before should equal all the energy out. We can't create or destroy. Turns out energy conservation only applies to the universe. It only applies to this outer ring. So I'm just going to write this down here. Energy is also conserved, and we haven't talked about too, too much about energy yet. Energy is also conserved, but energy is conserved only for the universe. The universe is made out of part system and surroundings. So here's what I mean. Let's say in yesterday's example, we had a collision. Let's say there was 100 joules of moving energy coming into it. We ended up later on having energies, maybe only 20 or 30 joules that are left over as moving energy. Where did that extra energy go? Based on those numbers there, let's say we had, again, here's the before and here's the after. Let's say we started off with 100 joules. Let's say we calculated that half mv squared and we ended up saying, oh, only 20 kilojoules is left. It looks like, sorry, 20 joules is left. It looks like we have actually lost energy. It looks like we're not obeying this formula here. But remember, this before and after is only the system. If my system started off with 100 joules, sure I can lose, uh, let's say in this case here, 80 joules. I can lose 80 joules, so left over in my system is just going to be 20, as long as my surrounding ends up picking up 80 joules. Using a money analogy here, let's say I were the system, I can give you, let's say you're the surroundings, I can give you 80 bucks. As I give you 80 bucks, I'm out 80 bucks, okay? My money drops by 80. But your uh, bank account will go up by 80 because you picked up that very same number. You'll notice energy, as we see in the next chapter, energy will also have positive and negative, this time not to indicate direction. It's not to indicate, oh, my money went forwards or backwards or left or whatever. The plus or minus just talks about whether the energy is in my system or it's been given out of my system. So this is something that we're gonna see more so in the next chapter. It is true energy is conserved. The 100 here should be conserved, but it's not necessarily conserved just in the system. Maybe the other 80 has been converted to heat energy and light energy and sparks and whatnot. Okay. So energy is also conserved, but only for the universe. And I just want to remind you, energy actually is a scalar. Uh, if I have a positive energy, usually scalars, oh, just magnitude. There's no sign to it. But in this case here, positive. Just like if I were the system, if my energy goes up, it's because energy went into the system. So energy absorbed or gained by system. 
Whereas in the next chapter when we see energy that's negative, it doesn't mean backwards anymore. That negative just means energy lost. So because the universe is such a huge, huge space to study, we have to uh, zoom in and we have to be like, okay, the system I'm looking at this time is just these two cars colliding, uh, and I'm just going to ignore everything else around. Ignore the spectators, ignore uh, what else is going around around this collision. So uh, in today's lesson, we're going to just practice again this P and equals BL. We're going to use this really strict thing here that says the momentum is conserved in both system as well as uh, as well as the universe as a whole, and then we're going to try to do energy conservation. Even though energy conservation only applies to the universe, both system and surroundings together, we're going to set up what's called a collision uh, elastic collision that actually actually conserves kinetic energy. So let's just walk our way through the question. This review from yesterday. Uh, a mass traveling, so it could be a car of some sort, a mass traveling at 5 meters per second collides head on with a 3 kilogram um, car traveling. Two meter per second in the opposite direction. So, I'm just going to draw you a quick picture of this. This is a head on collision, this is sort of as bad as it gets. We have a mass, unfortunately, we don't know what that number is just yet, so I'm just going to call it m for now. It's traveling at 5, I'm going to treat positive velocity as the forward direction. This happens to be going at 5 at the beginning. It's going to collide head on with the car. The car here is 3 kilograms, I don't know if it's bigger or smaller at this point. But the 3 kilogram going in the opposite direction, it's going at 2 meters per second. So I know pictorially I should draw an arrow here. Arrow not quite as big as before, but this arrow here is going to be 2 meters per second. But definitely because it's opposite, when we punch into our formula, I definitely want to see it. So this is a head-on collision. It's the uh, mass colliding with the car. That again is the B4 picture. We know about momentum conservation, but remember from yesterday's lesson, we need to be told something, like something about the afterwards. Do they, does one come to a stop? Do they stick together? What not? Being told that, we can use momentum conservation to solve the rest of the problem. In this case here, we're going to deal with what's called an inelastic collision. An inelastic collision involves these ones here actually sticking together. So we have a mass and a car. Again, I don't necessarily know which is bigger at this point. I just know the M gets stuck with the 3. And what we're told, I can only have one unknown, so I'm going to be asking you for M very shortly. But we're told that this one here ends up traveling continuing forward at 2.5. So you imagine a head-on collision, although I don't know how heavy this one is. This one here, as it zips forwards towards the 3 kilogram, it's moving quite a bit faster than this red object, red car here. And as they collide, even though they get mangled and sort of uh, stuck together, they continue going in the forward direction. That might imply to you maybe the mass of this end here is actually bigger than 3, such that we can still have that continuation, that tendency to stay in the positive direction. That's sort of just something that I'm thinking. We're going to try it out with the math here, and we're going to see if uh, that assumption is correct. So the physics is very simple again. It's going to be P in equals P out. If you like, you can even put that sigma notation. Sigma just means add it up. For every single object, I should have a momentum term. And remember, momentum is given by m1 times v1. So for the mass here, m1 times v1, plus for the car, I have m2 times v2. We said yesterday, even though we don't know the mass, right, we can still show it as, instead of actually saying m3 v3, I can say, well, this is just a combination of m1 and m2 together. Assuming that during this collision, I'm sure the two objects might get uh, mangled together, but at least the total mass is conserved, and we know that's going to travel off. Again, you could have said v3, but I'm just going to say v final, because they're just one object, and they're just going to head off in some direction. Let's punch through our values here. m is the unknown in this question, m1. The speed that we have is 5, I'm going to treat that here as a positive number. Add it to m2, which is 3 kilograms, what I'm expecting is a lighter mass. I had to put in this minus because we were told it was backwards, so negative 2.0. That has to equal to, even though I don't know what m1 is, I'm just going to have m1 as a placeholder. Once we find out what m1 is, I can just punch in this formula no problem. Plus the 3 kilogram car that I know. And the final velocity continues forwards at 2.5, so we're still multiplying that by 2.5. 
So based on energy conservation here, we can um, just work doing math. So 5 times m is going to be plus a negative 6 is equal to, this part here is a little bit more tricky. Because the m and the 3 are stuck in the binomial, your work is going to be actually distributing the 2.5m, multiplying the 2.5m, sort of undoing the factor. So 2.5 times m1 plus 2.5 times 3, 2.5 times 3 is equal to 7. At this point here, we solve the problem with this binomial. Let's just collect our like terms. Let's cause all the m terms to go to the left side and all the number terms to go on the right. m plus, oh sorry, m minus 2.5 is going to just be 2.5 m1. I'm going to go 7.5. I'm going to add the 6 over here. So I'm going to be 13.5, leaving you here with m1. Our unknown mass is 13.5 divided by 2.5 gives me a mass of 5.4 and just looking at those numbers there, we had expected, seeing as this one, this first mass here was traveling at faster speed than before, it had a positive tendency in motion, seeing as afterwards we're also going forwards, I had imagined that this was probably a heavier mass. So, based on momentum conservation, we can solve for that problem. It was a little bit different from yesterday because I gave you the unknown as m, I gave you all the velocity instead. Okay. Yesterday we also compared the kinetic energy term. If you remember the formula here, kinetic energy is given by half mv squared. Again, energy, it is conserved in the universe. Energy is conserved as a whole. But we want to know at least the specific form of energy, which is kinetic, which is moving energy. I want to know whether the moving energy is the same before or after. So in this case here, there's my kinetic energy. I'm going to look at, back at my numbers here. I'm going to imagine for my first object, let's try to do a 1 half m1 v1 squared. Let's add that to my car, which is 1 half m1 v1, so m2 v2 squared. This is equal to afterwards. Okay? Well, actually, I don't know it's equal. I want to test whether it actually is concerned. And later on, I just have half. I'm going to call it m total v total squared. So when they get smushed together, what happens? So I double check my numbers here. I get half. We just solve for m1. m1 is 5.4. I believe the car is going at 5 meters per second. So 5 squared. Let's add it to 1 half. The car was a 3 kilogram object. It was going at negative 2. Here's where you see the advantage of the formula. Uh, because the formula here has that v squared, whether my velocity was positive and squared, it's still positive. If my velocity was backwards, that's where the negative comes from. With a negative with the square, it also becomes a positive value. It makes sure that energy stays a scalar point. On the other side here, we have 1 half. The total mass is going to be the 5.4 plus 3.0, so 8.4. The final speed we were given earlier as 2.5. So let's just compare how much moving energy is left over in this collision. So we're going to go 0.5 times 5.4 times 5 squared. The first uh, mass here is 67.5 joules of energy. Joules is the SI unit for energy. 0.5 times 3 times 2 squared. You'll notice this now becomes a positive number. Energy is a scalar, it shouldn't have direction to it. Together, these ones here have 73.5 joules. This is the kinetic energy in. This is how much moving energy they have at the beginning. Let's compare it to the end here. 0.5 times, I'm going to do the 8.4 times it by 2.5 all squared. The amount of moving energy left over, unfortunately, is 26.25. Or 2 or 3 sig figs, this is still 26. This seems very uh, unusual to us because we're like, oh, we thought there's supposed to be energy conservation. Yes, in general, for my universe, there is total energy conservation. So let's say the energy in truly is the 73.5. It is supposed to be equal. You can't create or destroy it. It can't just suddenly vanish. So far, at least, the kinetic energy part that we calculated final is only 26. That means the remaining 40 or 50 joules has to be converted to other forms of energy, heat, light, um, you name it, uh, other forms of energy. So yes, energy is going to be conserved overall, but at least my system, which started off at 7.5, it's lost some 40 or 50, and now my system at the end has lost energy. So system has lost um, energy to the surroundings or the environment. And it only has this 26 joules left over. Okay. So it's still good, energy is still conserved. We'll see that much, much more in the next chapter. Uh, but at least we can deal with this kinetic energy. Uh, for the 
Uh, remaining this lesson here, what I want to introduce to you is we are going to study these collisions a little bit more. So far, we've been under the assumption of inelastic. Uh, the bounce is in such a way that they actually stick together. Turns out the elasticity of the collision uh, is actually two sides of the spectrum. So let's say I plot for you a little spectrum here. This is the elasticity. This is the, the bounciness of the collision. Okay, And it doesn't necessarily mean, oh, they, they uh, rebound off each other or they stick sort of or not stick sort of. But basically here, we can actually define an elasticity of 0%, which is our inelastic collision. This one here is the one that we just did. This is a perfectly sticks together. Perfectly sticks together. So that's the question that we just did. The two masses combined together. Or we can have a 100% elastic reaction, uh, elastic collision, and elastic collision here really will truly be a perfect bounce. What you're going to see in this case here is because these are sort of two extremes on the spectrum, we might actually have a bounce that's only 40%. Uh, elastic or 80% elastic or whatever. Uh, we're just going to compare the two extremes because we can do a little bit of uh, math. So for inelastic, I want you to remember inelastic means it sticks together. For elastic, because we're dealing with a perfect bounciness, there are other collisions that might also bounce off each other, but it's not quite as perfect. Elastic actually refers to two uh, different criteria. The first criteria we already know. First criteria is P in is equal to P out. The momentum before has to equal the momentum afterwards. That's true for everything, inelastic, 20% inelastic, it assumes for everything. But in addition to uh, this momentum conservation, the condition number two, if we are elastic, and if and only if we're elastic, we're going to actually have the kinetic energy in equals kinetic energy out. The balance was so perfect that the energy didn't get lost to the surroundings, it didn't get lost to heat, it didn't get lost to sound or light or whatnot. Uh, the actual moving energy before actually did match the moving energy afterwards. So uh, this question just mathematically will be a little bit harder, but we're going to apply these two uh, formulas here to study what's called an elastic collision. So, uh, let's just try out one last problem here. This is going to be an elastic collision. It's still going to be a one-dimensional collision. It's still going to be one thing hits another thing. And in this case, here for an elastic collision, I'm just going to sketch up some numbers for you here. Say I have a 2 kilogram object, it's moving at 7 meter per second, so that's positive, it's forward. We have a 4 kilogram object, it's twice as big. 4 kilogram object moving at negative 1.5. Why this velocity here is negative is to show you that the direction is actually head on, just like the one that we just did. We need to be told a little bit of what happens afterwards. The little bit that we're told is this collision is elastic. This collision here is going to perfectly bounce off each other. So what's going to happen is the 2 is going to stay perfectly separate from the 4 kilogram. Perfectly separate, but given a perfect bounce, I would imagine they were on a sort of incoming collision. After they perfectly bounce off each other, they should be leaving each other. In this case here, you could very well call this one here the V1F and the V2F here. Because we're going to be using these uh, letters a little bit more here, I'm just going to define, instead of actually writing V1F, I'm going to call this U. So where we see U, U is going to be the placeholder for the final velocity of the 2 kilogram, and I'm going to just call this part here V. I'm just going to solve a little bit of algebra for you later on. So U is just a placeholder for the final 2 kilogram speed. Uh, v is going to be the same for the other. So we're told that it's elastic. It seems like we're not getting enough information. But let's try it out. Let's start off with the one that we know, which is momentum conservation. Under criteria number one, P in has to equal to P out. So for every object that I have, I'm going to have an M times V term. So what we're going to have is an M1 times V1 plus an M2 V2. This has to equal to M1 V1 final plus M2 V2 final. Let's punch in the values as we have them here. So we have a 2 kilogram moving at 7, add it to a 4 kilogram. Because momentum is a vector, therefore velocity is a vector here, so this has to be negative 1.5. That actually has tendency to stay in motion in the negative direction or in the backwards direction. Afterwards here, because of the perfect bounce, the objects don't get negative together. We have 2 times my placeholder was a u, plus 4 times, again, my placeholder was a u. You could very well have said V1F, V2F, 
you're going to see in a second how this helps. So first object, 2 times 7, give you a tendency to say motion 14. The other one here, plus 4 times 1.5, this should be negative 6. So we have a negative 6, that has a tendency to stay in motion to the left. This has to equal to 2 times u plus 4 times u. So 14 minus 6 I can do, this is going to be 8, is equal to 2u plus 4v. But at that point there we're stuck. At that point there we do have one equation, we do have a relationship between u and v. Unfortunately though, we actually have two variables. You know in your math classes you can only solve it if there's only one unknown. In this case here what we'll need is we need another equation that links u and v. For this particular question, because I kept the numbers fairly nice, let's say the masses are exactly sort of uh, double of each other here, you'll notice that, oh, all these are even numbers here. This doesn't always work for every question, but let's imagine taking the whole equation. Let's divide 8 by 2, make it 4. 2u divided by 2 is just u. 4v divided by uh, 2 is going to be 2v. That way we can write a slightly simpler expression between u and v. Again, that step here doesn't always work, depending on your numbers, but in this case here, uh, it's nice to work that. That's our first equation. Where we're going to get our second equation is actually the second criteria. This is the new criteria that's only true for an elastic collision. Unlike the inelastic collision from earlier, unlike we had 73 before and now we totally don't have 73 afterwards, for a perfect bounds, if we had 73 before, 73 is still conserved afterwards as moving energy. So no energy is lost to sound, no energy is lost to light and whatnot. So in this case here, here's our second criteria, only because it's elastic. Don't do this for any other case. For an elastic collision, your moving energy initial also matches up with your moving energy. So moving energy here also gives you, uh, so Ke is going to be half mv squared. I'm going to have a Ke term for every single object that you have. One object before, with the second object, and 2v2 squared. This has to equal to uh, half m1. Again, I'm going to say u squared plus half m2 v squared. Again, it could have been v1f and v2f. This time, we could do a nice mathematical trick here. Because these two here are equal, we have a mathematical relationship. What we can do is we can come along and actually multiply everything by 2. I can just get rid of all those halves right from the start and therefore I don't need to actually punch in all the point fives that I really don't want to. So let's just punch in the rest of this here, uh, double check my numbers, I have a mass of 2, it is going at 7 squared, plus a mass of 4, going off at a negative 1.5, again the advantage for that square there is it takes any negatives into positives. My mass and perfect balance will stay the same, so I have 2.0 times it by u squared, and I'm going to add it to my 4.0, my twice as heavy mass, traveling off at b squared. Uh, let's simplify a little bit of this here. 2 times 7 squared. This first term here is 98. Plus 4 times 1.5 squared. I have a 9. So it looks like some little bit over 100 of kinetic energy to begin with. Um, this has to equal to 2u squared plus 4v squared. I'm being a little sloppy with sig figs, but that's okay. At the really end of it, I'm going to round to 2 or 3 sig figs. Let's do the 98 plus 9. I know this is not exactly the total kinetic energy, because I had already scaled it with a half, but it's sort of like coming in with 107 units of energy that's proportional to it. This has to be conserved. It has to be really equal. Afterwards, it has to all be there as moving energy between the first object and the second object. Okay. Um, so here I showed you sometimes the numbers work really nicely and where, oh, divided by 2 would actually be good. It's totally okay just to use this equation again. Not a problem. And here, if you think about your math classes, we now have two equations and two unknowns. I have one equation here that says 4 is u plus 2v. The other equation is this green expression that we just did here. What we can do in math class here is we can actually substitute. We can rearrange these expressions, make it, for example, so we're going to do a step of substitute. The math just gets a little bit harder here. So what I'm going to do, let's say I bring the 2v over to the left side. So u is equal to 4 minus 2v. I still have no clue what u is or v is, but I know based on this first expression, wherever you see u, that's going to actually be 4 minus 2v. That's my expression. So if I see a four, if I see a u anywhere, I can actually substitute. I can actually put in its place four minus two u. You'll notice I see a four minus uh, u right here. I'm actually going to substitute that four minus two u into this expression. 
So again, the math here is just going to get a little bit scarier. But again, this is the only way to solve it. We have two equations. We're just trying to uh, solve our way through for one letter and then get the other letter. So as we continue through the substitution here, let's take the second expression. We had a 107. Earlier it was 2 times u squared. I'm going to punch in the substituted one from the first expression. u is equal to 4 minus 2v, and we put a 4 minus 2v. That's going to be all squared, plus it by 4v squared. And you now, I know it looks horrible, but now we have just one equation with one unknown. It just has v as a variable, so therefore I can solve for v. Be really careful when you do this middle part here, because we are taking 4 minus 2v and multiplying by itself, Here's where you have to foil. You have to do your sort of first, outer, inner, last. And you need to scale those two terms and then multiply the two. So let's just do that work here. I have 107. I'm going to leave my 2 outside. I'm going to have the 4 times 4, which is 16. 4 minus 2b is negative 8b. Negative 2b times 4 is also negative 8b. Negative 2b times negative 2b is going to be a plus 4b squared. Let me double check my formula in there. That's 4b squared. Now I scale in the 2. So 107 is equal to uh, 2 times 16 is 32. This negative 8 and negative 8 would have been a negative 16. So times 2 is also a negative 2v. 2 times 4v squared is going to be an 8v squared. And then I'm going to still add this 4v squared to that side. And if you're starting to see what's happening here is we're actually ending up having to do a quadratic again. We have some v squared terms. In total, I have 8 v squared and 4 v squared. So I have, actually, let me show you one more step before I do that. 107, 32, minus 32 v, plus uh, 12 v squared. Actually, what I could do here, actually, let's do that one. I could actually minus this 107 over. So we have 0 is equal to, I'm going to rearrange it for you here, 12 v squared minus 32 v. If I took 32 minus 107, this gives me a negative 75. And finally, we have it written in our quadratic formula set. We have an ax squared plus a b plus a c. And basically, we have it equal to 0. Even though the quadratic formula is scary, at least it solves for me what the u is and what the b is supposed to be. So, we're not completely lost yet. Let's just keep going here. We have the b. This quadratic formula is in your formula sheet. Right? It's a negative of b. This is why first week of class we practice this. We're starting to see this actually show up naturally in our physics problem. Hopefully you've gotten enough practice with the math so you can do this. So we have take the negative of whatever b is. b is negative 32. I'm going to do the plus or minus negative 32 squared minus 4 times 12 times negative 75 divided by 2 times a, which is a 2 times 12. And this gives you here 32... I'm going to punch what's underneath the um, square root first. Okay, I'm just going to 75. Double check my numbers. I'm getting 4624 divided by 24. 32 plus or minus the root of that is 68 over 24. Here's where you separate the two roots. Either you take the plus or you take the minus. 32 plus 68 over 24 or 32 minus 68 over 24. Remember, our actual roots don't necessarily have to be one positive, one negative. This just depends on what the top numbers are. So I'm getting 4.2 meter per second, or 32 minus 68 divided by 24 negative. So after all of that, we've actually solved the speed that we'll need to be leaving at for both of the cars. At least the speed for the second car can either be 4.2 or can either be negative 5. The question here is, why are there two answers? In this case here, if you look back at the problem, this V here was the speed for the second car, you'll actually realize that the speed for the second car, initially the second car was already going at negative 1.5. So one of the mathematical answers, which keeps the energy the same, is just the V4. They haven't hit yet. What we want is we want, after bouncing off, if this mass were to go in a positive direction, what speed does this one here have to leave at so that the bounce conserve all the moving energy. There's only one speed that does it, and in this case here, it's actually going to be this one here. So this was the speed that I had before. I'm going to reject that solution. This is actually the speed that we need. Based on these masses, based on the math, um, based on the collision, we need to be leaving the 4.2. 
Now this one here is only the V, it's only the speed when it's leaving. At this point here, once we know one of the letters, getting the other letter is pretty easy. We said u is equal to 4 minus 2v. So if I take this v here, because u is equal to 4 minus 2v, I'm just going to write in here the u is equal to 4 minus 2 times 4.2. What's the other call? Just for completeness sake here, this should give me back the starting speed before hitting. Negative uh, 1.5. So 4 minus uh, 2 times 4.2. The first car has to bounce backward at 4.4 meter per second, whereas uh, at the beginning, 4 plus 2 times 1.5, it's a good way to check the work here. Was it 7 at the beginning? These, uh, U and the V, they come in pairs. So when the second car is doing this, the first mass had to do this. Or in this case here, for after the collision, the second car has to leave with 4.2, while the first car has to leave at negative 4. So if you matches up for yourself here. The solution in red here is exactly what we had before. The second car was moving back, negative 1.5. The car was moving 7. So there's that answer where the kinetic energy is the same number. After perfectly bouncing off each other, we have the first mass is traveling off at u, which is negative 4.4. And we have the other mass here is going to leave at uh, 4. So you see that it's only at these exact speeds that the kinetic energy can serve. Any other bounce, if it were only 80% elastic, 20% elastic, whatever, the kinetic energy would be different. Energy would have been uh, transferred to the surroundings, it would have been lost. But at least this is for a perfect bounce. So I'm going to give you a worksheet later on that gets you practicing just collisions in general. Uh, after, uh, towards the end of that worksheet, you can see one of these elastic problems. So if you have any questions, just let me know. Uh, take care, guys.